Welcome, I'm Mark Updegrove, the President and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. This evening, we're pleased to present a conversation with Chuck Robb about his recently released autobiography, In the Arena, a memoir of love, war, and politics. Senator Robb's book is aptly titled, He has spent most of his life, as Theodore Roosevelt called it, in the arena, engaged in military and public service. As an officer in the Marine Corps, he became a White House social aide, where he met and soon married Linda Bird Johnson, the daughter of his commander-in-chief, Lyndon Johnson. Soon after their spectacular White House wedding, he shipped off to the war in Vietnam, where he would earn the Bronze Star. Later, he would become Lieutenant Governor then governor of his home state of Virginia, and would go on to serve two terms in the U.S. Senate. Signed book plates of In the Arena are available at lbjstore.com. Our moderator this evening is Dr. Mark Lawrence, the director of the LBJ Presidential Library and a Vietnam War historian. And now, please join me in welcoming Senator Chuck Robb and Dr. Mark Lawrence. Well, thank you very much, Mark, and welcome everyone to what I think is a really terrific opportunity to hear from one of the really terrific leaders and remarkable public servants of recent times. Governor Rob, thanks so much for joining me and thanks especially for joining uh, this event with the Friends of the LBJ Library. I'm really sorry, of course, that we're not meeting together on the big stage down here in Austin at the LBJ Library, but I look forward to seeing you down here, I hope, before, before too long. Um, it's a great privilege, nonetheless, uh, via this uh, pandemic-enforced technology uh, to um, speak with you about your remarkable life, and especially, of course, about your wonderful new book, In the Arena, a Thank you. of Love, War, and Politics, just published this month. Uh, the publication date, I think, is, is, right, about, is right about now. Um, I, I will say for myself, I, I really enjoyed reading this over the last few days and was really impressed by your ability to weave together little nuggets of memory that are so, so, um, so, so fascinating and at the same time to kind of sweep across long periods of history and to comment on the broad currents of American politics and history. And I enjoyed as well the really uh, wonderful uh, forward by President Clinton. Mm -hmm. But let, let me uh, jump into all this, Governor Rob, by asking you about your decision in the first place to write such a book. Why, why write a memoir? Well, I recognize the fact that I'm not going to live forever, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge. Uh, and uh, I, when my own parents died, they both lived to their late 80s, uh, late, uh, late 80s, right. And now I'm in my 80s and I know and, and I've already passed the... Uh, life expectancy uh, that you uh, is very arbitrary. But in any event, uh, as uh, Bill Clinton used to like to say, that I've got a lot more uh, uh, sunsets uh, than, than sunrises left, uh, or I don't have as many sunrises. In any event, he had a, a clever way of saying that frequently, uh, and I'm obviously not quoting him directly. In any event, Bill and I have been friends for many years, and I very much appreciated uh, his willingness to give such a, a, a nice forward. And I, I think it's an interesting read. And a number of friends who have known me over the period of time uh, that we've known each other uh, had very nice things to say about it. Said, I learned a whole lot about you that I didn't know, uh, but they we just had an, a personal uh, friendship, uh, but we hadn't uh, explored each other's backgrounds. So that's what this is attempt to do uh, when I'm, I'm not here. Now explain the title, In the Arena, where does that come from? That comes from Teddy Roosevelt's uh, speech. He, I, it's always been one of my favorites. I, I won't give you the long version of it, and I recommend anybody, you can just look uh, probably uh, in the arena, Teddy Roosevelt would be enough. But he, he, uh, he said something that I thought really represented what I wanted to say. It doesn't sound like you're promoting any particular approach to life. It just says, here is what life is about. And if you want to be a part of that experience, you got to get in the arena. 
and, and that it can have ups and downs. Uh, it, it, again, it doesn't foretell a particular uh, end. It just says, if you want to be a player, get in the arena. One of the arenas where you achieve great things um, is the arena where you both start and end the book. And what I'm getting at is your service in the Marines. Um, why did you choose to start the book with the Marines and, and also in just a phrase or two at the very end, end there as well? Well, for all practical purposes, particularly with the LBJ library uh, and, and the interest that was generated because of my introduction into the uh, Lyndon Johnson family, uh, my life really began in 1967. And I wanted to put on enough of what uh, preceded that so it didn't look like I was suddenly born on that particular date. Uh, and the Marine Corps clearly uh, was an important part of my life, always has been, always will be. Uh, but most people uh, simply don't know what happened before I suddenly showed up at the White House uh, to say, I do. I want to come, of course, to 1967 in, in just a, a couple of moments, but you do have a few wonderful chapters in the early parts of the book that discuss your, your earlier experiences. I love the way you, you, you uh, captured your childhood. You, you write that you lived an existence that was, was neither charmed nor particularly difficult. Um, tell us a little bit about your, your boyhood and um, how that uh, led you on the path that you ultimately took. Well, it was clear to me that I was going to be, uh, I, I wanted to serve in the service. I, I, I grew up basically, uh, my uh, awareness of what was really happening in, in the big world uh, occurred during World War II, uh, and followed by the Korean War. And I, I knew that I wanted to serve and would serve. And so I, I had an opportunity uh, when I was in college to uh, select a particular branch in my case, the Naval Service. I started off uh, in, in a land-grant institution. You, everybody had to take ROTC. Uh, and I went into NROTC. And then I eventually got the scholarship uh, that from the NROTC that obligates you to accept a commission in e either the Navy or the Marine Corps for, at that point, four or five years. I don't remember exactly what it was then or now. But after you have uh, been commissioned, and so I had set my uh, course, uh, at least in that respect, early on. And I, I have absolutely no regrets ever about that course. It, it, sometimes people ask me, what was the most important decision you ever made in your life? And I, I made uh, the first decision before I'd ever met Linda. Uh, and so I, that the, the Marine Corps and their ethos and their uh, discipline and, and way of life and the way they uh, approach challenges was all a part of my DNA early on. It's striking to me that you entitle that first chapter where you sweep across the early parts of your life, the road to Quantico, as if that was the, the end point of all of those early experiences. Mm -hmm. And yet I, I'm also struck by the fact that there are some moments in your early life that don't necessarily fit that narrative of all things leading to Quantico. Tell us about an experience that I've just uh, learned about where you went to a dude ranch as a boy. <laughs> well, my, my father uh, had an uh, adventurous spirit. Uh, he had, uh, instead of going, he, he and, my, and my mother uh, both grew up in an era when their parents uh, were quite successful and they were able to send them to uh, very highly regarded uh, prep schools. Uh, and it, my father chose instead to go to the Aeronautical School uh, of Engineering in New Mexico and become a pilot. And, uh, and he worked in that field for some a number of years. And then he always wanted to, uh, he had an interest because he'd, he'd done, uh, basic, basically homesteaded uh, at, at that particular period of, of his life uh, in that area and uh, became familiar with the dude ranching business. And so he and my mother decided that they would uh, basically put everything else aside and, and move down and contract to operate 
a dude ranch. The first one of those was in uh, Sonoida, Arizona. It's one of those uh, blink and you list it, uh, miss it uh, sized towns where the, uh, the school teacher, I, I went to a one room school uh, which carried, covered this first six grades. It was taught by the wife of the owner of the only uh, gasoline station in town. It was, it was that small. Uh, so I, I didn't have a whole lot of, of uh, extra advantages coming in, but I, I didn't want to try to suggest to anyone that I, I had a, a, a difficult life. I mean, I, I lived a good life all the way through, not with ups and downs, to be sure, uh, but I'm, uh, I wouldn't trade it for any other life. Now, you were spectacularly successful in the early stages of your career as a Marine. You were an honor graduate, in fact, first in your class at Quantico, no small achievement. What was it that made you um, such, such a success in that arena? Well, I, I, I like the, the competition. I, I, the, and, and you're in competition with others that you believe are the, the uh, strongest and, and the uh, best and the brightest and whatever. Uh, so you, you know that you're not in a, an easy competitive environment. And that's a challenge. And that's always been a challenge for me. To, if, if it seems a little tougher, not, not an impossible dreams or whatever, but something that is achievable. And if, if I stuck to it, uh, I, I had switched colleges in, in, in undergraduate. And I, 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 that was not the most successful part of my life. I had had good grades all the way through high school, uh, uh, from, from elementary school up through high school. And I thought that it was a piece of cake. And I got, I was a, a national merit pol uh, finalist and I, I got a, a full scholarship. Uh, it started out at, at Cornell, but I had a good time. I hadn't been exposed to the big time. I'd been lived in a more rural type environment for most of my formative years. And uh, I got up there and I, I found there were pleasures that I had never had an opportunity to uh, uh, enjoy. And uh, if there was any time left over, I would study, uh, but it was not my best performance. I, I passed all of my subjects in engineering, but I wasn't thrilled by the, the, the course so much. Uh, and I realized that I could have done better uh, if I had, and, and the requirement for the scholarship was you had to, to uh, be in the top third of your class. And I was not in the top, I've passed everything, and I, I was just short of the top third. And so I, in effect, lost the scholarship. And at that point, I had to find another way to finance the remainder of my college education. Could have stayed there, uh, but I didn't have the money to, to stay there. And then I, I uh, looked at other opportunities. I, I had a competitive appointment to the Naval Academy at that point. I had an opportunity to get a, a competitive our NROTC regular program scholarship. I decided to go ahead and accept that because I didn't want to go back and repeat the whole first year. Uh, all that, that for many reasons might have been a, a good choice on my part. Uh, in any event, I, I was pretty well focused at this point that I, I needed to do well. Uh, and fortunately, everything worked out well at Quantico. And that gave me a credibility that I, otherwise I might have had. If I just suddenly appeared out of thin air at a White House wedding, of which I was <laughs> the groom, uh, I would have never, uh, I, I probably would never have de developed the kind of self-confidence that I had, which I had relied too much on uh, in, in my high school years, because uh, it all seemed to be easy. I, I, I liked STEM subjects, uh, math and science and whatever, uh, and it, it all seemed very easy. Uh, I had to apply myself even more. So I was determined that I was going to make sure that I didn't uh, slip in that process again. Now, you wound up at the White House. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is where you met the woman who had become your wife. But before I come to her, tell me about your impressions of her father, Lyndon Johnson. What do you mm -hmm. remember uh, most from first meeting this larger than life man? I normally tell people that whatever you have heard about Lyndon Johnson is probably partly true. Uh, I, and I can elaborate on whatever they have heard and, and uh, both uh, the things that most people would consider positive and things that others would 
suggest or a limitation. Uh, I, I thought he was he was a remarkable man. Uh, he had whenever he was in the room, he was the room. Uh, and I, I worked at the White House. I mean, I had several what I called very uh, plush assignments before there. I, my first assignment was to be the executive officer of the Marine Detachment on the USS Northampton. It was not known or public at the time, but that was the designated command ship for the president of the United States in the event of a nuclear war. And, and we did have uh, President Kennedy and his cabinet came aboard uh, during that particular period of time. Um, in advance of this uh, interview, we collected some questions from the friends of the LBJ library. Okay. And here's one that, that comes from, from our audience, although I think it's probably one that's on a lot of people's minds. Tell us how you met Linda and how difficult it was to get to know her amid the public spotlight that no mm -hmm. doubt shone on the White House. Linda and I have different recollections of our very first meeting. Uh, she believes it took place in the White House. I believe it took place at my then uh, assigned duty station at Marine Barracks, 8th and I Streets, Washington, D.C. But I had come to there after uh, these assignments on the Northampton, and I was a, the aide to the commanding general of the 2nd Marine Division, uh, had deployed overseas uh, a couple of times, uh, and I, I was very anxious to then uh, receive uh, orders to report to what was then called FMF back, Fleet Marine Force Pacific, where I knew there was uh, action, and I wanted to prove to myself that I was as good as the Marine Corps seemed to think I was. Uh, I had to get out and improve myself with the Money Boot Marines. I had several assignments that uh, ended up being great assignments, but they didn't allow me to get in. And I, I had a, a, an unfulfilled uh, desire on my own part, purely personal, uh, to just prove that, that I was worthy of, of the honor the Marine Corps had bestowed on me. And, and as I say, that made it a whole lot easier to deal with all of the difficulties that almost anyone else would have uh, coming to the White House. I, I stood right next to President Johnson on most of the state dinners uh, and or other big functions, and I would introduce the people who came through the receiving line. I would give their, their, their title. Uh, in most cases, he would know that already, and their name. In most cases, he would know that already, but it's just easier for anyone who is uh, the uh, focal point of, of a receiving line to have somebody giving them both the title, if the title is warranted, and, and the, the name, and, and they can uh, immediately engage in a, a sentence or two of, of greeting. But Linda uh, was much more prominent at that particular point. She would frequently, as the eldest daughter of the President of the United States, would be invited to come to events, and she would be expected, in most cases, to have an escort. And she was kind enough to pick me to be her escort. So, and, and we got to know each other uh, up in the solarium where, where we would uh, sometimes uh, retire at the end of a state dinner to play bridge. A couple of times it was with uh, ambassadors and their spouse uh, and the four of us would sit down at a bridge table. It's a great place to look out. You can see all of Washington, uh, lights are on, uh, it, it's a pretty scene and, and it's entirely private. Uh, not, I don't know of any photos, I guess during at least one subsequent administration, somebody took uh, a photo, I think, in the in the solarium itself. There are probably a lot of photos around, uh, but it wasn't well known, but that, that was a, a truly private place. Even the Secret Service would, would not uh, stay with you in that area. They would obviously uh, restrict any traffic coming into the White House or into the upstairs part of the White House. Any event, that, that was the uh, environment into which I was introduced. And fortunately, I, I had uh, nothing but good experiences. Uh, and we hit it off early on. And uh, Linda has always been a collector of books and uh, illustrated and uh, authors. She's got more friends uh, that I have inherited uh, over the years. And she would uh, frequently uh, meet with some of those folks uh, and or go to take trips abroad uh, and there was a, a bibliophile of uh, great distinction uh, who invited her to go over to England uh, and meet with Ernest Shepard. 
uh, that and, and Linda whispered to me as, as we're saying goodbye. Uh, she said, and, and this is in the book. She said, well, when I get back, we've got to talk. <laughs> and, and suddenly a, a light goes off. I may have been missing any number of signals over the period of time, but I started thinking seriously about it. And we got when she came back, uh, I think the very first thing that we were able to do uh, was we want to and the first thing that we were probably ever invited to as a couple. She had some other very high profile boyfriends or, or whatever at that particular time. But anyhow, Jim uh, Ketchum, who was the curator of the, of the White House, he and his wife invited us to come over to have dinner uh, shortly after Linda got back. And, and we had a great time, a couple of other couples with us. So it was the first time we had really been a couple, not just Linda and her escort. Uh, any of it, we came back to the White House, went up to the Slurim, as we often did, uh, talked for hours, I guess it was. At, at some point, it was probably very early in the morning, and this is covered in the book, uh, uh, we decided to get married. It wasn't the usual, somebody, uh, the, the uh, uh, prospective uh, husband gets down on one knee and has a diamond ring to present to uh, the love of his life or whatever. It, we just reached a mutual decision uh, and it felt good. And, and Linda wrote about it. She was in uh, writing for McCall's magazine uh, and later for, for Good Housekeeping. But she she uh, wanted to, to, to she was very excited and wanted to go in and tell her parents. And this is all covered in the book. Uh, we have the excerpt from uh, from that particular period. And uh, her father, when she tried to sneak into their bedroom, they're already asleep. And she tried to sneak in to, just to talk to her mother. And her father said, don't you want to talk to me too? And at that point, she just let it laid, laid it all out. And, and uh, the next morning, when I'd gotten back to Marine Barracks, I, I sent her some, uh, some uh, roses. roses. Uh, they were inadvertently delivered to her mother. And, and Linda saw that and said, those are mine. <laughs> Anyway, it was, it was all, it was just it was a very uh, great time in our, our, our life together. You cover all this, as you say, in such wonderful detail in the book. Mm -hmm. And of course, also the wedding itself. What is your sharpest memory from that very memorable day? Well, I was uh, about as uh, comfortable as you can get. Most uh, prospective brides and grooms are saying this, this is a big decision. You're, you're making a decision to not be your own uh, ship in the night or whatever it is. You're going to be a partnership for the rest of your life. Uh, and, and you stop and think about that and a little nervous. I, I was uh, as confident as you could get because I knew that uh, while I had had lots of very appealing uh, young ladies that had been kind enough to be my date or invited me to various functions over life, this is the person I realized I was now going to settle down with and spend the rest of my life. So the, the wedding is a formalization of that long-term relationship. And I thought that the, the photo that I liked best was really the one of her father. Uh, you can see the love in both of their eyes. I mean, it's unmistakable if, if you look at those photographs. Uh, in any event, I, I was, uh, I was uh, supremely uh, happy and confident that uh, my life just got long-term better. <laughs> I'm fascinated by your mention of photos. And I, it seems to me that many of us remember these seminal moments of that period so much through the, the terrific photos um, that, that, that are, are left to us from those days. I wanna ask you about a different photo um, that, uh, brings us on to your service in Vietnam. So uh, shortly after you were married, you went off to Vietnam for some of the reasons that you've already touched on. Um, talk a little bit about how you kept in touch with your new wife mm -hmm. and uh, with maybe in ways that weren't entirely clear to you with uh, the Johnson administration more broadly, uh, while you were overseas in Vietnam. And what I'm getting at, of course, is that famous image of LBJ listening to the recording that you sent back. Okay, we started off writing letters to each other. Linda did a much better job than I did. Uh, when I was out on extended operations and not back on my combat base, uh, I would have to wait until I got back uh, to get her letters. And there would normally be several 
that I could read and enjoy and, and, and whatever. But her father had given each of us a uh, portable uh, recorder uh, that, uh, so that we could communicate in, in, in voice. We didn't have the cell phones and whatever. We're a long way off at that point. Uh, but we could actually hear each other's voice. Uh, and that was great. Uh, but the weather over there was not conducive to uh, any electronic uh, products uh, faring very well. Uh, and occasionally the, the heat was so intense that the, the, the battery simply uh, wouldn't record at full speed, uh, even, even close to it. And fortunately, the, the WACA people, the, the White House communications people, were able to re-record what I had sent. And Linda's father kidded her about the, well, what, what's this smart uh, young man you do, uh, can't, doesn't know to, when to get to speed right, or I don't remember the exact language. I, I put the best recollection I had in the book, uh, and we both got a kick out of that. Uh, fortunately, it was, was reconstructed for him. And, and then after I, uh, well, I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit in, in Vietnam, uh, but a after we decided to get married, uh, I did want to go through the formal procedure of asking for his daughter's, his eldest daughter's hand in marriage. And I, I was able to get a, a, a short appointment uh, with his secretary. And uh, I, I met him over uh, actually in, in the Lincoln bedroom. And uh, I, I got there first and, and he came in, it was just a, a minute. Uh, and uh, I, and this is again, all in the book. Uh, I said, Mr. President, I, I think you know why I'm here. And he gave that, that very warm reassurance, I, I think I do. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that he'd, he'd probably, and I, I never, I don't think I've ever raised this before, but because you have at, uh, access to all of my uh, records at that point, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if he didn't do a quick double check and make sure that this wasn't somebody that shouldn't be coming into our family. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that. Uh, and, I, and, and there was someone, and I, I decided not to, to name that individual, but somebody on his staff that I knew believed that they were doing something in his best interest, said, you have more than fulfilled your commitment uh, to the Marine Corps. You don't have to go to Vietnam. Right. And I said, you don't understand. I've been trying to get to Vietnam. Yeah. And I kept I had to kept, keep each uh, fitness report. You say, what would you like? Uh, what is your preference for next duty station? And I was always either something along Westpac or or uh, combat environment, whatever, and I'd get sent to even better assignments. Right. Uh, and, and I said, well, this is great. And that's how I got ended up after I, I was, I'd gone to the, the uh, Mediterranean on a, on a battalion landing team, came back, was assigned up to the White House. This is one more time I wasn't going over to Vietnam. And I was disappointed until I realized, and until I met Linda, I guess, uh, and it was, after that, it's, it's, it's all a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question that comes to us from our audience mm -hmm. uh, goes like this. Did, did people treat you differently in Vietnam knowing that you were the son-in-law of the commander in chief? I don't think so. I don't know of any occasion where I was aware of anyone doing anything uh, that was not by the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I never made any particular uh, announcement uh, when I finally got the command of the company, but I, I know enough about how organizations operate. You always have some time you're informally together with other members and someone would get uh, uh, a hint of that fact. Do you know that the skipper is, is actually married to the daughter of the president of the United States? Uh, no one ever confronted me with that directly. I did occasionally later on get questions about, you know, what's it like to live in the White House and what's all these kinds of things that are fairly predictable, uh, but at the time I wasn't, uh, wasn't aware of it. And there was never any, anything on, on my part, even when uh, in, in this case, General Westmoreland came over, he came to, to, to brief the, uh, uh, the president uh, on developments in Vietnam. And Linda asked him if he would bring me uh, uh, a, uh, a tin of, uh, of uh, oatmeal raisin cookies, which he had baked for me. Uh, and he was smart enough not to hand them to me or have it generate all kinds of ill will for me and for him. He had a, a, another person who was traveling, traveling with him to, to quietly give them to us so I could enjoy them on my own. And I, I shared some of those, uh, but it was a, uh, uh, th th there, there was an instance at some point where somebody 
uh, I think it was subsequent to Vietnam, uh, were doing a story on me. And so they contacted one of the Marines who served in my company. And they asked essentially the question that, that whoever submitted that question was asking. And, and his, his response, no, uh, they, uh, if, if, you're, if you're wearing Marine green, they shoot at you. Uh, they don't care who you are. <laughs> and, and that pretty well summed it up. And I, I think, ever, again, if I had not had a very good experience to start my formal Marine Corps career, I might have been overly sensitive to that. But I, I knew that I was... I didn't have any doubt in my own sense or ability or what I could do. Uh, and I, I just wanted to prove it uh, to myself as much as anything else. Let's talk a little bit about another arena where you obviously achieved great things, the, the world of, of politics. Talk about the transition from your military career into politics. How did you decide on a career in politics at that point in your life? Well, I, I wasn't always planning to be a, a politician. Uh, I, I did my Marine Corps experience, the simple fact that you have to know that you need to be able to uh, instill a sense of trust in anyone you're asking to do any kind of work, but particularly if it's uh, potentially life-threatening work, they have to be able to trust you that you have their best interest uh, at heart and, and you understand them. And you're not going to ask them to do anything you wouldn't be willing to do yourself. You can't, in most cases, you can't actually physically fight the war as such. Uh, we got beyond that period uh, well over 100 years before. Uh, but uh, you're the, your role in this process, as a, as a company commander at first, and then I was promoted to major and I had to give up my company, uh, was is to make sure that you're carrying out the mission and doing everything you can to fulfill your mission and to pr make sure that you're the, the troops under your command are not exposed to avoidable uh, casualties or difficulties. Uh, so your job is, is to, to make sure that you're making rational decisions to do what you're expected to do, and, and th they will do most of the actual fighting. Again, if, if you develop the respect of those that you're leading. And so uh, I recognize that I could, could, have, could make a difference in the political process. And I was interested in that uh, ability to, to make change. And certainly in Virginia, uh, we had uh, <laughs> our, our role in the, uh, all the, the enslavement of the Civil War and all of the Jim Crow that followed it. I mean, we were the center of much of that. And uh, it, it, was, it was a significant challenge. And, and I wanted to, to work on trying to bring us at that point into what I considered into, into the real 20th century. Uh, and uh, since then, of course, now in the 21st century, but they, we've, we've made tremendous progress in that area. That's the most satisfying reward in my judgment about public service. You can see things happen. You know that you've had a constructive role in making them happen. Uh, and so you can be content. Would you uh, describe the accomplishments that you were just touching on as your greatest achievements as governor? Probably. Uh, I mean, it was important to me to uh, put that part of our history behind us, uh, the ongoing uh, discrimination uh, and unfairness uh, that was taking place. Uh, and I was able to appoint uh, a very significant number of uh, women and minorities to positions of real responsibility uh, in state government, not just employees to do some of the uh, maintenance and whatever. Uh, and there's certainly plenty of that. And we had, uh, there was a, uh, a fairly good cross section of the whole uh, population in, in those areas. But previously, the, the policymaking positions, the ones that had real leadership associated with them, had gone disproportionately to white men. Uh, and I was able to appoint a number of people that broke that tradition. Uh, I, uh, the one that was most obvious, I guess, I was able to appoint the first African-American to the, the Supreme Court of Virginia. But I was able to bring into positions I, I brought in as, as my Secretary of Public Safety. And again, thinking, I, this, was, this was with malice and forethought, if you will. Uh, I wanted someone who wasn't just uh, a good old boy that was just used to uh, the use of force. 
I mean, the Secretary of Public Safety uh, was responsible for both the state police and the prisons. And uh, they're not likely to be uh, as open to under understanding of what's going on to people inside. So I brought in a, uh, a very uh, bright, uh, highly regarded uh, African-American uh, lawyer uh, who was much more uh, accustomed to speaking in, in uh, terms of uh, justice uh, than, uh, uh, than simply just more force. And it's now uh, Virginia is, is moved from the uh, uh, Jim Crow capital for a long period of time uh, to a much more uh, progressive state, uh, a much more uh, conscious state of, of the human condition. Uh, and so making progress in that, it's not a single accomplishment, although I was, was able to uh, bump the uh, teacher salaries in education which had always been one of my priorities, up to the highest in the South. They had been uh, well down the list uh, nationally uh, when I took over office. So when I was coming in, I asked the outgoing governor, uh, a good friend, a Republican, uh, I said, if you don't mind, uh, don't put all of your discretionary money into something other than education. Let's let's put it in there, and I'm going to follow up with that. And I did, and so we were able to, to from a uh, very modest uh, ranking in, in the national uh, hierarchy to be the highest paid teacher salaries in the South. Anyway, th those are the kinds of things that are satisfying uh, and, and that give you a sense of, of, of performing uh, responsibly when it's your turn in the arena. My turn has, has, has expired at this point, and I'm going to continue to encourage people that I think share those kinds of values and objectives uh, but I'm not, uh, uh, there's a, not a great uh, demand for octogenarians uh, to lead. Uh, well, I mean, uh, again, being older than all the commandants of the Marine Corps uh, or the, the, uh, the last five or six presidents, whatever, uh, th there's no particular demand for anyone my age right now. But I'm going to encourage and support those who make difficult decisions that will eventually look like why didn't somebody recognize that this is the right thing to do a long time ago? It seems to me, Governor, that you represent, that your political career really embodies a brand of politics that's all too rare in politics these days. I know you write in your book that you don't particularly care for the word moderate. Um, you, you, um, you obviously don't want to be pigeonholed in any particular... Now, that's exactly the point. I don't want to be pigeonholed in, in, in thinking that just because somebody has classified me as either conservative, moderate, or liberal, whatever the case may be, that I'm going to be automatically required uh, to accept whatever is the conventional wisdom for what a conservative, moderate, uh, liberal uh, might think about X, Y, or Z. Uh, many of the positions that I have taken, uh, particularly for a, a very conservative state, and one was much more uh, uh, enlightened much less enlightened early on uh, was the fact that I, I, I could do some of these things and make sure that I had the right people, that, that they would, would make it easy for the, those who succeeded in positions of responsibility to make the same kinds of appointments and be expected to make those kinds of appointments. Governor, let me ask you a question that I think a lot of people are struggling to answer these days. How do we get back as a society to the political situation in which your career really thrived, in which we weren't quite so ready to pigeonhole people and assign them to categories on the political mm -hmm. spectrum, and we, where we respected debate and dif differences of opinion? How do we get back there? I wish I had an easy answer for that. I mean, I would like very much to get back to that kind of an environment. Uh, I took particular... Uh, delight in being able to work across the aisle. So I, 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 and I, I tried to, to line up when I could with uh, fellow Democrats uh, on issues that I thought were on the same wavelength. Uh, but if, if we were on opposite uh, ends of the wavelength or whatever the case may be, I, I would stand up for what I thought I would, would uh, promote positions, which may or may not be uh, the kinds of things that people who are 
getting into a nominating contest. And now they talk about somebody uh, that doesn't vote for a, a particular ind individual. And the threat is that within their own, their own party, Republican or Democrat, th they're going to be pr primaried, which means they're going to get somebody who is more likely to be uh, unbending uh, in uh, taking the absolute position on any particular issue. And I just never wanted to be in that part. I, I've, it, it's been uh, my experience that if you, if you do what you think is the right thing, but you believe in your heart of hearts, uh, if it happens to ali align with some, something that's politically popular, <clears throat> it's easy enough to do. There were times when I was in public life where I would have people that were coming along and in some cases, uh, now very respected uh, public officials who would call me say, I've got a really tough situation here. Frequently it, it, it evolved around religion uh, that uh, said my, my heart, uh, my, 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 my religious beliefs require that I take a particular position. Uh, and uh, I, I can't square that with, with the electorate or whatever. I said, tell people what you believe they'll respect you for it. Uh, and I've had compliments come back from folks that I said to, I mean, I, I don't think that's ever bad advice. I mean, if, if they think you're, you're giving them the, the straight skinny, so to speak, uh, and, and they, it, that goes back to trust uh, and, and your, your willingness to listen to the other side. So I'd, I'd like to solve this problem. I am, I am distressed, and as you'll read in the book, by this uh, uh, tribalism approach. Where, where my, my tribe requires me to be either for or against X, Y, or Z. Uh, I don't think that's healthy. I think to the extent you can come to common uh, resolution of questions that are important and then be able to explain those to the public and, and stick together on them, I think that's all good. But to say that you are going to, quote, vote for or be for or against something based on some strictly political considerations uh, that you think that that's what your quote base requires you to do. I just absolutely reject that categorically. Absolutely. And, and here, here's a, a, a final question that actually comes from our audience, I think is a, a really terrific one to end on. What advice would you give to someone who's aspiring to be the next Governor Rob to get into the arena and to achieve great things in the world of politics? Well, get engaged, uh, accept the things you cannot change, have the courage to change the things you can, and have the, <coughs> excuse me, the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, and again, I think if people follow their conscience on those kinds of things, uh, they're unlikely to ever get in any serious difficulty with themselves, their, their friends, their conscience. Uh, that's the reason I don't like to be pigeonholed by somebody else's uh, de decision that he must be a blank A, B, C or whatever, uh, because I want to have the freedom to follow my conscience on, on votes that may not be perceived as being uh, that from that particular persuasion. Uh, again, it it's, it's makes dis decision making a whole lot easier. It, I have uh, all of my life have found that uh, that, you don't try to tell something that you know is wrong uh, and then later uh, slink back in and say, well, I apologize or I, uh, I admit that I was mis mis in effect misleading you uh, or telling you something that I did not believe to know to be the truth. Uh, th those are the kind of folks that get in, in all kinds of difficult dilemmas uh, personally uh, with themselves. Um, I don't see how anyone can can represent something to be true that they know not to be true uh, and, and, and get a good night's sleep. Well, Governor Rob, I want to thank you again for this wonderful book, In the Arena. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for your time. And I certainly hope that many people out there in the state of Virginia and across the country will be inspired by your words here and, and your words in this, this wonderful interview. Thank you so much again for taking the time to be with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. I very much appreciate the invitation to join you. And I appreciate those who are friends of the LBJ Library who uh, 
are active and, and uh, in the arena and will come to, to meetings, particularly when we get back to in-person meetings, uh, if that ever happens. Uh, I mean, I, I, I miss that aspect of it. I, I like to deal with people and I, you're very easy to deal with uh, over the internet. I mean, over the Zoom, uh, because uh, for whatever reason, we're looking at each other uh, in a way that uh, I, I, I feed off of an audience. Linda's father used to be very good at that. <laughs> if, if, and any politician who can't read their audience. Uh, now, a lot of times I would make speeches on something. I knew the audience was flat against it. And I would, particularly in things that military or conservative audiences, I would try to, to reason with them, uh, a, a word that uh, Linda's father used frequently, reason together. Uh, I, I think that's what being a part of life is all about. And that's what uh, makes it uh, uh, both challenging and rewarding. And I appreciate the folks that are friends of the library who want to uh, continue to make uh, some of the uh, lessons that uh, Linda's father uh, left behind available to more and more of our citizens and encouraging them to get in the arena. Well said, and we can't wait to see you back in Austin, hopefully sooner rather than later. I will look forward to it. Fantastic. Thank you again. Th thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck and Mark. As a reminder, signed book-plated copies of In the Arena are available at lbjstore.com. Thanks to our programming sponsors, the Moody Foundation and St. David's Healthcare. As another reminder, we depend on your membership support to produce programming like this. I encourage you to visit lbjfriends.org to learn more about becoming a member. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.